the foreword to this book, you talk about how we're all trained by our language to hear the world in a certain way. Would you like to share your thoughts on how this works with our audience? I think that particular example I was using related to the title of the book, Gidja Gidja Ganeshi Gikendan. So Gidja Gidja Ganeshi is our way of saying chickadee in Anishinaabe Mwen. And we often get taught to hear the world around us a certain way. There's patterns that become familiar. So you could argue that it goes both ways. Um, arguably the very first person that said Gidja Gidja and Ganeshi was hearing that and created the word. But now for the rest of us, now that that word already exists, when we learn it, it becomes what we hear when we're out listening to chickadees. Some of us may also hear chickadee dee dee, it depends on which you're used to. So I think that we just have to be mindful about the delights of linguistic diversity and how multiple ways of hearing the world around us can be really beneficial. Oh, doors opening all the time, I think. Multiple things, one being a kid and walking around with my dad who would listen to the birds and answer the birds in their language. We would learn to understand when he was mimicking a bird and calling a bird or when he was using a call that was intended for my sister and I and it meant come home for dinner, you know? So learning to use language differently and learning to think about birds as having their own language is something that uh, I think I was lucky enough to be invited to do at a very, very early age. Then as I grew older and got much more interested in the linguistics of Ojibwe in particular, because where I was growing up in Minnesota at the time, it was a language we were working hard to revitalize. I found that these were separate things. So I would write poems in English, but I would study Ojibwe language and I wanted to find a way to connect them. So even then when I was pursuing an MFA, I wrote a lot of poems in the language, but at the time people said, no one will want to read those. Just use a word here or there. If you want to be published, you have to write mostly in English. And I, I believed it. So I'm here to say to young poets, do not believe what you are told to do ever. <laughs> you know, Do the thing that makes sense to you because I knew as a learner and as someone who wanted to keep the language going, I needed to use Ojibwe as the main language. After a while, I sort of gave myself permission, perhaps as an older person, I said, no, I'm just going to do what I think I need to do. And that was to write first in Anishinaabe one, because if people are careful readers, and even if they don't know the language, but sound them out, you can see the rhythm, the pattern, the line lengths, the sounds that I'm playing with in Anishinaabe one are a little bit richer and more complex. And the English is a, is a nice approximation, but the more complicated poem would be the one that I wrote first in Anishinaabe one. And then I do my best to give it a reasonable representation in English. I mean, one would be the fact that I have always had elders tell me, elders as in my own parents, my grandparents, or when you hear elders saying, now this is a story from long, long ago, and you know that what they mean is a story that's been handed down through large expanses of time, um, that you really listen to the whole world around you. So in one sense, that's a bit of a rhetorical audio kind of tradition to follow. And if you're in North America, obviously the Great Lakes, um, that confluence you have right at now in English, it's called Walpole Island, but the Kejuanong, um, First Nation over there, right in between Canada and the U.S., right at the edge of Detroit and Windsor, you know, that becomes a tradition. If the Kejuanong is the place where the waters do a certain thing, some of those sounds and ideas, I think, get written into our poetry. On the other hand, I've also had a lot of fun translating Chaucer and Hafez and any number of poets that have spanned different centuries and their traditions um, influence my work as well. So I would not say that I ever tried to stay within one space. Um, I really look at all the ways that I've encountered that humans have 
try to delight one another or uh, question one another or challenge or you know, I suppose even sometimes frighten one another into thinking something they wouldn't have thought until they read that poem that you might have given them. Until some of the things that, you know, colleagues my age or other folks that I know are working in language revitalization were doing this, I really felt a lot of indigenous languages were anchored in the past. So even if I mess up or people don't like my poems, at least it's creative use that's moving forward. So, so I really do appreciate when people are willing to just take that leap of faith and say, here's a language I don't know, but I'm gonna let someone play with it. Um, Thank you.